Hello, it's very good to share with you again with the Darling Downs Easter Convention. Today is Easter Sunday, and as is quite normal within Christian churches, we remember the importance of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Easter will determine our fate. Well, so said Health Minister Greg Hunt just this week. He was talking about combating COVID. 19. He spoke far better than he realised. The church has been saying that for 2,000 years. Easter does determine our faith. When we come to Luke's gospel and we think through the issues of the kingdom of God, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is an extremely important part of the whole in inauguration of the kingdom of God. Let me read to you from Luke 24 and verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrapping, wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marvelling, at what had happened. The term the kingdom of God turns up 121 times in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It turns up five times in the gospel of John and eight times in the book of Acts. Uh, the concept of the kingdom of God, as we've already seen, was heavily rooted in the Old Testament. And as you go through the birth narratives, of the Lord Jesus in Matthew and Luke, you discover just how deeply rooted in the Old Testament promises, in the Old Testament covenants, in the Old Testament concept of the kingdom of God, this was really uh, found. We find the promise of the covenant in the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17. We find the promise of the kingdom of God in covenant in the Davidic covenant found in 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. Jeremiah's promised new covenant found in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 and 37 also follows this concept of the kingdom of God. The gospel infancy narratives of Allow me just to read to you a few passages from those narratives. Picks up very strongly on the Old Testament ideal of the kingdom of God. For instance, in Matthew chapter 1, we read that all this you know, about the birth of the Lord Jesus took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets might be fulfilled. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 32, we read that he will be great and he will, he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. In Luke 1 and verses 11 to 17, there's the angelic announcement to Zechariah of the birth of John. And it says, and it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. It virtually quotes from Malachi chapter 4 and verses 5 and 6. This announced kingdom gives us the concept that it would be established by one like Elijah before the day of the Lord, when the prophetic kingdom would finally be established. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 35, the angelic announcement to Mary by the angel Gabriel had a strong emphasis on the Davidic covenant from 2 Samuel 7. Luke 1, 27 ties the engaged couple and their child directly to the Davidic line of the descendants of David and the son of the Most High. He would have the throne of his father David, with Luke 1, verse 33, introducing the kingly reign with he shall rule and the terms his kingdom. His kingdom shall have no end. In Mary's Magnificat, her, her prayer of praise in Luke 1, verses 46 to 55, it ties in the birth to God's judgment on Israel's enemies through the Messiah and then the restoration of Israel. Zechariah, John's father, in Luke 1, verses 66, 67 and 69, links John's coming to the Messiah as a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, salvation from our enemies. And a direct linkage is made to the oath which he swore to Abraham, who also functions as the forerunner of the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 2 and verses 1 to 12, you remember the situation of the Magi from the east seeking to honour the newly born Davidic heir. And this is a direct link to David's city of Bethlehem and the prophecy of the Israelite king's birth in Micah 5 and verse 2. It is quite interesting that this whole idea of the kingdom of God is then carried on a little bit further with the inauguration of John the Baptist's ministry in the desert. In Matthew 3 and verse 2, it tells us that John the Baptist would come and he would foretell the kingdom. He foretold the kingdom that was presented in the Old Testament, and he would preach a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Some would be baptized with the Holy Spirit when the Lord Jesus came and experienced the messianic salvation of the kingdom of God, while others would be baptized with the fires of final judgment. So Jesus' announcement of the kingdom of God himself in Matthew's Gospel and in Mark's Gospel, what followed the same theme as John's preaching. John preached, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The Lord Jesus preached, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew relates that Jesus' preaching of the kingdom was accompanied by signs evident as to the authority of his message. So Jesus' miracles of healing and cleansing and exorcism are tied directly to Old Testament prophecy concerning the role of the Messiah in Isaiah 61, which is repeated in Luke chapter 4 and verses 18 to 21, when the Lord Jesus opens the scriptures in the first time in the synagogue in Nazareth, he talks about the role of the Messiah and that he had come to fulfill that role. At Capernaum, Jesus directly declared his purpose for his preaching in the declaration of the Messianic kingdom. When day came, it says, Jesus left and went to a secluded place and the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also for I was sent for this purpose. So the concept of the kingdom of God was something that the disciples had a good hold of. The Lord Jesus had taught about the kingdom of God from the moment of his first preaching by the banks of the Jordan. The Lord Jesus continued to preach about the kingdom of God by the Sea of Galilee. 
Many of his parables were about the kingdom of God. When the Lord Jesus was in Jerusalem, he talked about the kingdom of God. Much of the teaching of the Lord Jesus focused around this concept of the kingdom of God. It says that there was a real anxiety in the people of the day for an understanding of the kingdom of God. They wanted to see an inauguration of the kingdom of God. Why? They'd been oppressed first by Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire, then by the Roman Empire, and they'd felt so oppressed for so many years, their hope was for a messianic deliverer who would redeem Israel. And in redeeming Israel, would give them the, the blessings of that messianic kingdom that were prophesied in the Old Testament prophets. So as they considered the role and purpose of the Lord Jesus, the disciples had it in their mind that they were going to see the inauguration of the kingdom of God very, very quickly. But rather than see the inauguration of the kingdom of God, they saw the Saviour crucified. They saw their friend and Lord beaten, bashed, crucified, dead and buried. And so they were devastated. Listen again in Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. One of them, Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Now listen to this. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said. But him they did not see. The disciples were in despair. They had a despair over the kingdom of God. Their despair around the kingdom of God was that all of their hopes for the redemption of Israel had been crushed. Their concept of the kingdom of God was in a purely earthly format. They expected the Lord Jesus to be raised up as a king in Jerusalem immediately. And they expected that the whole of the oppression of the Roman Empire would be over very, very quickly. But that was not what occurred. Rather, what occurred was that they were absolutely confused. They were in dismay. They were in despair. They didn't know why things were not as they had hoped. And then we read on. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. 
So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognised by them in the breaking of the bread. Well, the Lord Jesus has now brought in something completely outside their thought or experience. All their thoughts about the kingdom of God were for an immediate physical kingdom, and so they were in despair. But the Lord Jesus takes them back to the Old Testament scriptures, probably to all of the Messianic, uh, Abrahamic, Davidic covenants, and shows them that he had to suffer in order for those covenants to occur. He's taking them further. He's showing them that there is something more than what they expected. There's a disclosure. There was the dismay. They were in dismay. But then there's a disclosure. And read on with me from verse 36. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of a broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. There's the disclosure. And the disclosure that the Lord Jesus makes is about the reality of his resurrection. He wanted them to see the evidence of his resurrection. The evidence, well, first of all, there was his voice. Then there was the appearance of him before them. And the third bit of evidence was he ate. And another bit of evidence was he allowed them to touch him, and to see that he wasn't a ghost, but he was the real deal. He was actually physically raised from the dead. Then there was the prophetic evidence. So look with me, verse 44. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, that you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power. From on high. The Lord Jesus has talked about his disclosure. He's shown them who he is. He's shown them that historically he is risen from the dead. He's shown them that prophetically he had to fulfill all those scriptures that were there in the Bible before. And that these scriptures demonstrated that he would suffer and die and be resurrected on the third day. The purpose for this was to enable the disciples to have a, a clear understanding, a clear conviction 
of his resurrection from the dead. That meant that they'd be able to reconceive the concept of the kingdom of God in the terms which the Lord Jesus had announced to them many times, that his kingdom was a spiritual kingdom first before it became a real physical reality that it would involve the preaching of the gospel, that there was something different to his kingdom. So there's the disclosure. Look with me, if you will, over to Acts chapter 1. This is the continuation of Luke's gospel. In Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 through 6, the disciples are still grappling with this concept of the kingdom of God. Let me read it to you. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Wow. Well, let's stop there just for a second. The next bit is really important. But he's saying that he appeared to them many times over 40 days, demonstrating again and again and again that he was truly, physically risen from the dead. Now, these disciples have got a problem. Their concept of the kingdom of God was that the Lord Jesus would suddenly reign on a throne in Jerusalem that everything would be sorted out for them materially. Everything would be sorted out for them under a, a new kingdom. But the Lord Jesus is going to explain to them something else. Uh, look with me. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, verse 3, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Ah, the disciples had held on to that view that perhaps now the Lord Jesus was going to inaugurate his physical kingdom. Well, read on. Verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They couldn't get out of that trap, could they? That's where their thinking was. Look at verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. You, you can see the similarities to Luke chapter 24. But did you notice now that the Lord Jesus has spoken about a delay? There's the delay. The kingdom of glory, where the Lord Jesus sits on his throne in a physical manifestation, was delayed. And instead, there's the kingdom of grace. That's what theologians call it, where the gospel of the kingdom goes out to every nation so that any person of any nation may become part of the kingdom of God in a spiritual manner before the inauguration of the physical kingdom of God. Now, that's incredibly important, isn't it? The kingdom of glory, when the Lord Jesus comes to be glorified in his saints, the kingdom of glory, when every wrong will be righted. The kingdom of glory, when the great white throne of judgment 
is brought to bear where every person stands before that great white throne of judgment to be judged for their deeds in the body. Before the kingdom of glory, there's the kingdom of grace. And we're in that kingdom of grace now. We get to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you see that in verse 8? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. That's the dynamic of the kingdom of God. The dynamic of the kingdom of God involves the message, you shall be witnesses to me. You shall be witnesses to me. You shall be by witnesses. You're going to talk about the gospel. That's what it said in Luke 24. Let me read it back to you again. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name, where? To all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The kingdom of grace occurs when the message of the gospel is, is transmitted to others. When people hear of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins. You might remember what the Apostle Paul said about the gospel. He says, this is my gospel. This is what I receive, which is of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. He said that's what's most important, that the gospel be proclaimed. And he says that they're witnesses of these things. It's not just the message. It's the messengers. You have a very important task that you have been entrusted with. You are trusted. You're trusted with this wonderful message of forgiveness of sins. That repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. That's the role that God has entrusted you with. He wants you to share that gospel so that others can be part of the kingdom of grace. You are entrusted with a mighty task. Isn't it good to know that you cannot do that on your own and neither are you expected to? Did you remember what it said there in that passage? Verse 49. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. They understood that he was talking about the Holy Spirit of God. They'd be his witnesses, it says in Acts 1 and verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. You have a part in the kingdom of God. If you have trusted the Lord Jesus as your saviour, then you too have been clothed with power from on high. The Holy Spirit of God came into your life. We're told in Ephesians 1 and verse 12, the moment you believed in the Lord Jesus, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's the Holy Spirit who causes you within your heart to cry out, Abba, Father, to God. 
you know that there's a new relationship between you and God because the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. He's changed your heart. He's changed your mind. Ah, and now you are clothed with power from on high. God has equipped you with his Holy Spirit to enable you to share the message of salvation with others so that they can enter the kingdom of God. What a tremendous privilege you have. You are trusted. You know, the only way that you discover how trusted you are is when you are tested. Will you take this gospel to others? It's this gospel that gives everlasting life. It's this gospel that is the power of the kingdom of God. Have you surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ to present that gospel to others? There's a beautiful old hymn. That the words are wonderful. The music's great too. It says, I vow to you, my saviour, all earthly things above, entire and whole and perfect, the service of my love. It's a love that asks no questions. It's a love that stands the test, that lays upon the altar the dearest and the best. It's a love that never falters, the love that pays the price. It's a love that makes undaunted, undaunted, undaunted love's final sacrifice. When today I hear you calling to serve, to help, to heal, I will go forth and answer boldly in power you reveal. To the lost, the brokenhearted, to the children I will go. In your wondrous name, Lord Jesus, to see your kingdom grow. I vow to thee, my saviour, all things from earth above, entire and whole and perfect, the service of my love. And there's a royal country I've heard of long ago. It speaks of grace and heaven, a place that all may know. We may not count her armies, we may not see her king, her emblem on a hilltop, the cross of suffering, and soul by soul and silently her citizens increase. Her ways are ways of gentleness, and all her paths are peace. O oh, tell me of the kingdom that stands the test of time. O oh, lead me to its gateway and speak the word sublime that tells me I am forgiven. My name is in the book. The cross of Jesus holds me, as heavenward I look. Baptised into a living hope, I'll walk the path that's new, and the prize of God in Jesus forever I'll pursue. How about you? Are you part of the kingdom of grace? Are you working for the kingdom of grace? Are you looking forward? To the kingdom of glory when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in glory as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what it means to be in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we need your help that we may proclaim your gospel, that others may see and hear and repent and believe and turn to you as their King, their Lord, and their Saviour. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. There's only one more to look at in this week. And the last one we're going to look at, the last study we'll share together, is about the kingdom of glory and what it will be like when we are in heaven with the King of glory. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow.